So a long, long time ago, this man named Jesus, who I'm assuming you know because you're here in the room, this man named Jesus had resurrected from the dead, and he gathers his disciples, and he says to them, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and surely I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. And you know what his disciples did? They had the audacity to believe what he said and do what he commanded. And so they believed that Jesus had indeed been given all authority in heaven on earth, and they believed that he would be with them wherever he, wherever they went. And so they actually obeyed the command, and they crossed boundaries, and they told people about Jesus, and they made disciples. And those disciples crossed boundaries, and they told people about Jesus, and they made disciples, and so on, and so on, and so on, until Christianity really became a worldwide religion. Fast forward a little bit, 1800s, we have what's called the Great Missionary Century. And in the Great Missionary Century, uh, all these people start answering the call of Jesus to go to the nations. And missionaries just poured out of the United States and out uh, out of Europe, and they went to all these really hard places, and they shared the gospel. And the gospel seeds were planted, and they took root and disciples were made, and they formed churches, and those churches started working together, and they formed associations and networks and conventions, and those conventions and networks started thinking about theological education, and they started thinking about how are we going to send our own missionaries, because we don't want to just be the recipients of this mission, we want to go and be part of this mission. And then fast forward to what John tells us is going to happen at the end of time, where People are going to be standing around the the throne room worshiping God, and it's people from every language, tribe, nation, and tongue. And we're smack dab in the middle of that story, right? So to give you an example of that story, I'm going to to move to story number two, which is a a bit more recent and a bit more personal for me. So in fall of 20. 23, I and my and, and two other people, the uh, Dr. Dr. Julia Higgins, who is our director of women's programs here, and a, a graduate student of ours at Southeastern, boarded a plane and went to Togo. Now, how many of you guys know where Togo is? And, and, and here's the, the reality, not Tokyo, Japan. Togo, Af- West Africa. Uh, so Togo, West Africa is this little country in obviously West Africa that speaks French because they were colonized by the French. Historically, the Togolese adhered to a traditional African religion, or multiple traditional African religions, actually, and a form of voodooism. But God. But God brought, sent people who took the gospel to the people of Togo, and there was a whole group of Togolese who decided to follow after Jesus. And there are lots of believers in Togo, West Africa, and there are lots of churches in Togo, West Africa, and there's a Baptist convention in Togo, West Africa, and there's even a seminary in Togo, West Africa. And so a year before, I'd been working with Baptist women around the world, and I met some women who said, hey, we have Baptist women groups in Togo who would love for you to come and talk about how how they can, how they can get some theological education. And so I started a conversation with Baptist women groups. And when I I say Baptist women groups, think very similar to what you may have heard of like WMU here, Women's Missionary Union, if you know that term. Uh, Basically, it's women who gather together to pray, pay, and participate uh, participate in missions. And these women, uh, these groups here in the United States, uh, were actually kind of duplicated and recreated in other parts of the world as the gospel went forth. So we've got women who are gathering together, again, to pray for, pay for, and participate in God's mission in other parts of the world. And these women said, hey, we we really need, we really need further theological training because we have women who love God and they love the mission, but they need the tools to be able to do this mission well. And so Dr. Higgins and this student and I got on an airplane, made the long trek there, and we met with 70 women from three different French-speaking countries in West Africa. And we did a three-day conference where we just talked about the basics of biblical hermeneutics. How can you read the Bible faithfully? And in this time, Dr. Higgins set it up beautifully. She, she told the story of two women that the Bible, two, two types of women that the Bible talk about. On one side, you have uh, the, the immature women who don't know the word of God and therefore are kind of blown by every false doctrine or teaching. And on the other side, you have the church mothers who learn the word of God, know it well, and faithfully teach it to other people. 
and Dr. Higgins called the women of West Africa to view themselves as church mothers who need to learn the word of God well so they can teach it to other people. And so these women started a three-day process where we just talked about how do you even do that? We talked about the, the story of scripture, uh, the overarching story that the Bible teaches. We talked about how do we, how do we know that the Bible is true and that it is God's word? We talked about some basic principles for interpreting scripture faithfully. And then we actually talked about what does that look like to do in, in a narrative context where you're looking at Bible stories? And what does that look like in, in uh, epistle context where you're looking at these letters from Paul or Peter or who else? We gave examples of how we might do that for ourselves in our own context. And then we actually walked through passages with them uh, where they actually spent time thinking about the Word of God and looking at the broader story of Scripture and how it fits in the broader story of Scripture and doing some of the hard legwork to be able to come to an understanding of the meaning of the text. And they talked about how they would faithfully teach that to other women in their own context. And by the end of the time, they actually had written songs where they called the church mothers to be able to faithfully teach the Word of God to the other women in their churches. So, this was one of the, the most incredible experiences I've had in my life. I, I travel a lot for global theological initiatives, um, but I, I have never been in a room with, with 70 women who said, we love God, we love his mission, we want to learn how to love his word more. And they would sit there in breaks, and we would we'd say, go get coffee, go get food, and they'd be sitting there pouring over their Bible because we, we don't have the opportunity to study the word of God together. And I had women who came up to me afterwards and said, we understood pieces, but now you've given us a bigger picture. And we had women who came up and said, we've always been told, like, this is what the Bible says, but we've never been given the tools to actually understand it ourselves. Thank you. So why do I tell you this story? Well, there's kind of three, three things I want you to take away from these couple of stories. I've talked about the global church. Number one, I want you to recognize the reality of the global church. Whether you go or whether you stay here and go to, just, and go to your neighbors here, um, you need to realize that God is on the move across the globe. And so when you are disappointed or discouraged or frustrated with whatever's in front of you, remember that Jesus promises he's going to build his church. And he's doing it. He's doing it in Africa. He's doing it in Latin America. He's doing it in Asia. And he's even doing it here, just sometimes in unexpected and unseen ways. But Jesus is building his church, and you know what he says? He says the gates of hell will not stand against it. So be encouraged. Number two, some of you, I hope, are thinking about going yourself on the mission field. This is a mobilization conference. We are, we are calling you to consider whether or not the Lord is asking you to go. But what I would ask of you is as you think about going, we often have in our brain just this, I'm going to go to the place where no one's ever heard, and I'm going to kind of lone wolf it there, and I'm going to be the person who says, who, who shares the gospel, which is a great thing. But let me give you a different vision. Maybe the Lord is asking you to go and work alongside a global church. And just maybe your team is going to be made up of multicultures and multi-ethnics as you guys work together for the sake of the gospel. And maybe God is going to call you to a place where there's already a church and he's going to ask you to pour into that church and mobilize them for the sake of the gospel because they can often go where we can't go. Don't miss that opportunity. And when you go overseas, if you're, if you're somebody the Lord is calling, when you go overseas, think about how you can listen to, learn from, be encouraged by, encourage them, teach them, walk alongside, learn from, and mobilize the global church. And finally, I want to talk specifically to the women in the room. Um, I, I want you to hear, some of you might be considering, am I called to go overseas? Is it safe? Can I do it? All those questions. I want you to hear, God is in the business of using women for his mission. He's done it for, since the inception of the church, really. Um, <laughs> but we think about these incredible missionary women who've gone before, Lottie Moon, Charlotte Atley White, uh, Ann Judson, um, Rebecca Naylor. There's all these people who have gone and faithfully served the Lord as women. 
And then there's, there's people in the room, even, even the one you heard from this morning, there's women in the room who are faithfully going now. And God is raising up women from every tribe, language, nation, and tongue to be part of his mission. So if God is calling you, women, put your yes on the table and be willing to go. So my, what I hope you take away from this, God has a global church. Uh, he is raising up people from across the globe to answer the call for his mission. And there's, a, there's an old proverb that says, we can go faster alone, we go further together. And that's what I hope you would take from this moment. As we go out, as we think about missions in the 21st century, we will do it better and we will go further if we do it together with the global church. Thanks, guys.